Daniel chapter 4, starting in verse 4, I'll read to the end of the chapter. Here now the reading of God's holy word. Nebuchadnezzar was at rest in mine house, and flourishing in my palace. I saw a dream which made me afraid, and the thoughts upon my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. Therefore made I a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might make known unto me the interpretation of the dream. Then came in the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. And I told them the dream before me, that they did not uh, make known unto me the interpretation thereof. But at the last, Daniel came in before me, whose name was Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God, and in whom the spirit of the holy gods, and before him I hold the dream, told the dream, saying, O Belteshazzar, master of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in thee, and no secret troubleth thee, tell me the visions of my dream that I have seen, and the interpretation thereof. Thus were the visions of mine head and my bed. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth, and the height thereof was great. And the tree grew and was strong, and the height thereof reached unto the heaven, and the sight thereof to the end of all the earth. The leaves thereof were fair, and the fruit thereof was uh, much. And in it was meat for all. The beasts of the field had shadow under it, and the fowls of the heaven dwelt in the boughs thereof, and all flesh was fed of it. I saw in the vision of my head upon my bed, and behold, a watcher and a holy one came down from heaven. He cried aloud and said thus, Hew down the tree and cut off his branches, shake off his leaves and scatter his fruit. Let the beast get away from under it and the fowls from his branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump of his roots in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass, in the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts in the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from a man's, and let a beast's heart be given unto him, and let seven times pass over him. This matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand of the word of the holy ones, to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomever he will, and setteth up over it the basest of men. This dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now thou, O Belteshazzar, declare the interpretation thereof. For as much as well the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known unto me the interpretation, but thou art able, for the spirit of the holy gods is in thee. Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished for one hour, and his thoughts troubled him. The king spake and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation thereof trouble thee. Belteshazzar answered and said, My lord, the dream be to them that hate thee, and the interpretation thereof to thine enemies. The tree that thou sawest, which grew and was strong, whose height reached unto the heaven, and the sight thereof to all the earth, whose leaves were fair, and the fruit thereof much, and in it was meat for all, under which the beasts of the field dwelt, and upon whose branches the fowls of the heaven had their habitation. It is thou, O king, thou, O king, that art grown and become strang, uh, strong, for, my great, uh, for thy greatness is grown and reacheth unto heaven, and thy dominion to the end of the earth. And whereas the king saw a watcher and a holy one coming down from heaven and saying, Hew down the tree and destroy it, leave the stump of the roots thereof of the earth, even with a band of iron and brass, and the tender grass of the field, and let, it, uh, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let the portion be of the beasts of the field, till seven times pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my lord the king, that thou shalt drive thee from uh, men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen. <clears throat> and they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over thee, till thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomever he will. And whereas they commanded to leave the stamp, uh, stump and the tree roots, thy kingdom shall be sure unto thee, and that thou shalt have known that the, ki that the heavens do rule. Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee, and break off thy sins by righteousness, and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. And at the end of twelve months he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power, and for the honor of my majesty? While the word was still in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee. And they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as an ox, and serve uh, seven times shall pass over thee, until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomever he will. The same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from men, and did eat grass as oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his hairs were grown like eagles' feathers, and his nails like birds' claws. And at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High. And I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation 
to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and as doing, uh, doeth according to his will in the army of heaven, and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? At the same time my reason returned unto me, and the glory of my kingdom, mine honor and brightness returned unto me, and my counselors and my lords sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all whose works are truth, and his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride he is able to abase. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. And join me in a prayer this morning. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you have brought us low, that we might know the mercy and grace of your gospel through Christ. Lord, I pray that we would not be haughty in heart, but that we would be um, receptive to your word this morning. Lord, I pray that your word would cut and would instruct and would bind up and would edify Lord, I pray that you'd make less of me, that I might make much of Christ in the proclamation of this word this morning. Lord, help us to hear and help me to speak as as you would have me. pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. Brothers and sisters, many have asked, why is it that God allows evil in the world? Or by extension, if God wants good for us, then why does he delay? Enduring sin and the increase of our folly. Why not hurry it up and get on with it? Why does, uh, why does he not allow or, even, or why does he allow or even inflict pain or humiliation upon his creation, especially his elect? We have esteemed ourselves high and lifted up, but we are dust, unworthy, oh, <laughs> unworthy of God's love. And yet God shows his love for us that at the right time Christ died for us sinners, the righteous for the ungodly. God makes an instrument of death itself to intone amazing grace to us. In much the same way, when we were yet sinners, he utilizes the pain and judgment we bring upon ourselves as a means to bring about repentance unto salvation. And for those in the household of faith, he causes us to reflect upon his goodness, responding in repentance unto righteous works, humility, and great contentment. Put simply, when we stray into pride and arrogant self-rule and sinful rebellion, God will execute judgment as a form of mercy to drive us to reconciliation with him. By God's grace, he allows, even causes us to come under his disciplining judgment, that we might become conformed to the image of Christ, who, blameless before the Father, submitted to divine judgment to secure the salvation of all who believe. King Nebuchadnezzar's story arc in God's redemptive plan is one such example of God's merciful judgment. So let us consider that Nebuchadnezzar has thus far experienced. Right At this point in the story, Nebuchadnezzar is not simply... uh, unaware of who God is, right? First, we see the preservation of Daniel and the three at the beginning of, of the book of Daniel. Uh, they are, in a sense, miraculously sustained on, on seeds and, uh, you know, beans, <laughs> uh, and that they actually prosper, and he gives glory to God over this, right? Uh, we see the announcement and the proper interpretation of his dream. It should really make us wonder why chapter 4 starts off with him going again to these magicians that have been no good to him thus far, And yet he still is turning back. But we see that Daniel is the only one able to not only give the right interpretation, but to give the dream itself without foreknowledge. Right? We also see the miraculous preservation of the three in the fiery furnace. Nebuchadnezzar has witnessed the power of the Almighty and has actually praised the power of the Almighty multiple times. Multiple times. He has esteemed and recognized that there is something unique about this God of Israel that is different than Bel, his false God. Yet in this passage, we find that King Nebuchadnezzar still has not learned his lesson. So let us consider the passage at hand. I've broken this down in, in sort of uh, two sections for us. One, we're going to go through the uh, essentially the narrative itself, and then I'm going to work through some applications for you this morning as, as is typical practice. But I've titled the sermon this morning, uh, Pride and the Mercy of Judgment. And, and the reason why, if you haven't kind of gathered already from introductory statements, is that oftentimes God actually extends his mercy to us through a form that we don't think is merciful. We tend to think of mercy as purely God uh, restraining evil or restraining pain and and punishment and as a way of sort of absolving us from punishment. That's true. That is absolutely true. But he doesn't do it by merely removing punishment. 
He extends mercy by placing punishment upon Christ instead of us. That's an important thing. For God to be both just and merciful, there must be a penalty paid for sins. This is why the gospel exists. So that Christ might be the one true innocent lamb who is also the Lion of Judah. He takes upon himself the punishment that we are due and then extends to us the merciful gift of salvation through his obedience and his work on our behalf. But God also tells us in, in Hebrews that he disciplines us as a father. And so oftentimes when we feel like we are under judgment from God, uh, sometimes that's self-inflicted by, by sin, right? We sin and there are natural repercussions to our sin. Other times it just seems out of the blue. Lord, I, I feel like I'm being faithful. You, you have sort of that Job moment where you're like, everything's going great. I'm, I'm faithful. People are, are speaking highly of me. I, I'm very humbled by where I'm at right now. Things just seem to be going well. And then everything falls apart. Everything falls apart. And we look at God and our temptation is to say, why, oh God? Why, God, are you doing this? <clears throat> and, and so what I want to extend to us this morning is that God oftentimes allows these trials causes these trials in our life as a means to actually administering further mercy to us by giving us trials and ways to depend upon him or, or the demand us to to uh, uh to look to him this actually is a way of extending mercy to us uh, so this morning we're going to look at the story of nebuchadnezzar who as we just read in that in that fairly lengthy passage there uh is kind of met the final straw now the first three verses which i didn't read this morning it says, uh, starts off with a declaration from the king, Nebuchadnezzar, the king unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell on the earth. Peace be multiplied unto you. I thought it good to show you the signs and wonders that the high God hath wrought up, uh, toward me. How great are his signs, how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion is from generation to generation. King Nebuchadnezzar is telling this in the first person, which means he's accounting it to Daniel. Daniel's writing this down. That's very unique. And uh, we've talked a little bit over the past few weeks about whether or not Nebuchadnezzar is actually saved. And as we can see from this passage, clearly he wasn't yet. <laughs> clearly he wasn't yet. He was syncretizing his belief. He merely took the God of Israel, recognizing, well, this is the only God that can do this. He's the only one that can save from the fire in this way. But he didn't say that he was the only God, period. Right? He was still syncretizing and bringing forth his God to stand in sort of the pantheon on the shelf next to Bel. I'm going to put uh, Nebo and Bel over here. Those are my gods. And then, hey, the God of Israel is pretty cool. I'll put him here too. This is the temptation that we all have this day. And that's how I started this, this sermon series off, was really warning us at the, at the beginning of Daniel against syncretism, against bowing down to the idols and the other religious views of the day. Uh, and so we see now what happens. The Lord our God is a jealous God. And any who would seek to worship him will have to reconcile and work with that reality, meaning that they will have to have all of their idols smashed. And this is something that we too must submit ourselves to. Uh, if we truly want to pray that dangerous prayer of, Lord, help me to worship and know you better. Lord, help me to esteem you as just and holy and righteous and true. Be prepared for some pain. Be prepared to have God take an ax to the root of every idol in your life and to bring you down low that you might be brought up. That is the hope of the gospel, that when we turn to Christ, he will have lordship over us. He will rule over us as a merciful Savior. And if he does so, right, if we genuinely submit ourselves to him, we can expect to have those things that we esteem next to Christ, equally to Christ, more than Christ, to be brought down. Oftentimes these are easy for us to admit, you know, the, the sin of lust or, or lying or deception or greed, right? We're okay to a certain extent with those idols being smashed. We recognize the goodness of those idols being smashed. But what if your idol is your family? What if your idol are good things that you've elevated to a point of God things, as I've heard it put? What happens when God actually brings down your love of something that he has given as a good gift and then actually says, no, 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 you must love me even above this. We must be willing to submit to God's loving judgment in those moments that we might actually have his mercy extended further, that we might be elevated and restored to fellowship. So we see here at the beginning of verses 4 through 7, King Nebuchadnezzar's decree. This is again a repeating of his folly. Why is he going to the Chaldeans again? Well, they fail again and again. He continues to turn to his magicians, to his uh, so, sort of his soothsayers and wise men of the day. And if you remember correctly, at the end of chapter 1, Daniel and the three were esteemed to the wisest in all of the Babylonian Empire. And if you recall, I, I made the point that it wasn't merely of their sort of graduating class in the indoctrination school of Babylon, but 
legitimately the foremost wise men in the entire kingdom, which was a vast kingdom in that day. We see language in this passage of to the ends of the earth, right? When you see that poetic language, it is meaning to the known world. Now we, by God's grace, have seen that dominion extend, right? The, the, the gospel of Christ is extending to the ends of the earth. Does that simply mean a small area? No, Christ actually surpasses all of this. So that language is a precursor to the advancement of the gospel. But we see this morning uh, that these wise men knew better than everyone. These men also were preserved through fire and flame, not even smelling like smoke. And yet, what does King Nebuchadnezzar do? I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house, flourishing in my palace, verse 4. I saw a dream and it made me afraid. So he made a decree, verse 6, to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might make known unto me the interpretation of the dream. And they all come, verse 7. So they fail. Shocker. <laughs> if we turn to the wisdom of the world, it will fail us time and time again. And as I've, I've advocated before, I'll remind us just briefly again, we must quit esteeming the wise men of the world as superior to that which God has revealed to us. The Bible is not a science textbook. It, is not, it doesn't tell us how to do a lot of things, right? There are a lot of things that the Bible does not instruct us on in practicality. However, principally, it is the worldview by which all truth must be examined. There is no truth apart from Christ and his creation. There is no truth apart from God and his revelation. And so whatever it is that we seek to apply ourselves to in the world, we must look at it through the worldview of Christ and his word. Um, it is not that science is contra-religion, but rather that science only makes sense in light of the one true religion. So why is it that they fail? Well, they fail because they do not have the one true God to look to, who is the true revealer of knowledge. In verses 8 through 18, we have the dream sort of given out in detail. Verses 8 through 18, uh, he says, uh, Daniel comes before him, whose name is Belteshazzar. And just a quick note, he says, according to the name of my God. Uh, last week, I extended to you the fact that, uh, Belta, uh, that Nebuchadnezzar refers to him as Belteshazzar by his Babylonian name. And he says, of my God, um, does not necessarily mean that the Nebuchadnezzar, even in declaring all this, that he is still worshiping Bel. Um, there's sort of a debate, and I'm going to make the argument by the end of the sermon, uh, that I do think Nebuchadnezzar genuinely repented uh, and genuinely believed. At least that's kind of where I'm at on it. Uh, you can disagree on that. It's not a matter of, of doctrine and, and orthodoxy. But the fact that he says, my, my God, I think Raphael is referring mainly to the fact of my God, like the God of my people. And I think actually part of the reason we're going to see by the end of this passage that Nebuchadnezzar calls in the Chaldeans, calls all these, as I, I almost wonder if he was troubled in trying to reconcile who the true God was. Oftentimes when we think about when we came to faith, and I don't know when what, what your background is, but when you come to faith, sometimes it's almost like you want to test God. Like if you're really, if you're really who you are, let me, let me put you to the test. Now, we're not supposed to do that. I don't recommend it um, necessarily, but I think that might be what Nebuchadnezzar is doing here. He's sort of putting God to the test again, and of course is not very surprised. We don't see as much wondrous language here. He goes to the Chaldeans. Yeah, they failed. He turns straight to Daniel. Turns straight to Daniel. We see here this vision of the tree, and we'll have Daniel's interpretation here shortly in verses 19 through 27. But 8 through 18 is this picture of the tree. And again, Nebuchadnezzar's head is already pretty puffed up, right? We, he's... He's the head of gold on top of the big statue. Uh, now he's depicted as a tree who is sort of, you know, governing the, the, the land and providing for the land. And he's this wonderful thing. Uh, but what ends up happening by the end of that dream is that it is cut down. It is cut down and bound about. Now the stump is preserved and Daniel's interpretation tells us why. But ultimately he is brought low. Uh, one thing I did want to make a quick note of before we move on to the interpretation, though, is, is this concept of the decree of the watchers. You'll see that phrase a couple of times. Um, a lot of people get caught up on this language uh, and, and kind of wonder. There is uh, more writings about the watchers, particularly in what, what's called the Book of Enoch. Uh, it's an apocryphal work. It's not part of our, our scripture. Um, when we see the watchers, this was the common term. In, in uh, Aramaic for an angel, sort of Babylonian language. This is Babylonian for angel. Now, what I think is happening here is not specifically a, an authority. Some people have taken this passage and then looked at the divine counsel of God and lesser gods to sort of create a, a class of angels that are above angels but below God, sort of like lesser gods. I think that's a very dangerous uh, kind of way of thinking to get into. 
So while there is truth to the fact that I do believe God has created a number of spiritual beings with, within uh, you know, the spiritual realm that we cannot see, and the Old Testament is, is full of examples of that, um, we shouldn't be bogged down in the weeds over one use of this word. A watcher is merely referring to an angel. And ultimately it talks about the decree of the watchers. Some people take that to mean, well, they must have authority. But what do angels do? What does angelos mean? They are messengers who proclaim. So we, we see later in this passage that it says by the decree of the Most High. It doesn't say by the decree of the watchers at the end. It says the decree of the Most High. So their decree is merely an extension of the, the decree of the Most High. So I think the best way to read this and interpret this is not to get caught up in the weeds and thinking about, well, what kind of you know, angelic being is this? It is a proclaiming angel telling him what the Most High is trying to say to him. And that decree belongs to God and God alone. So... We can talk about angelology and demonology and some of those things maybe in, in a conversation. I do think it can be fruitful. It's very interesting. But in general, if the Bible doesn't speak clearly, we shouldn't speculate into these things too far because it can be very distracting. And what ends up happening is you create sort of a different system of thought that can't be clearly defended from Scripture itself. So, so just word of warning there, um, but nothing that we need to be worried about. Some people read words like that and get kind of nervous like, oh, what if I don't understand this? Um, a watcher is a type of angel, a designation of an angel, and that's what we should know from this. Verses 19 through 27, we see Daniel's interpretation. This is where I'll spend a little bit more time this morning. It says, Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished for one hour, and his thoughts troubled him. The king spake and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation thereof trouble thee. Belteshazzar answered and said, My lord, the dream be to them that hate thee, and the interpretation thereof to thine enemies. So he goes now and essentially recounts what Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream. And he goes through point by point and explains. He says, The tree that thou sawest which grew and was strong, whose height reached unto the heaven, and the sight thereof to all the earth, whose leaves were fair, the fruit thereof was much, and in it was meat for all, and the beasts of the field dwelt under it. And upon those branches the fowls of the heaven had their habitation. It is thou, O king, who art grown. He rightly designates that Nebuchadnezzar is the tree and is what is representative. He says, whereas he saw a watcher and an holy one, so this angel, angelic messenger, coming down from heaven and saying, cut down the tree, hew it down, destroy it. Yeah, leave the stump. And it talks about the dew of the heaven and the time passing over. He says in verse 24, This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High. See, there it is. Decree of the watcher, decree of the Most High. Ultimately, it is God who is speaking and giving the declaration. Regardless, if I were to stand up right now and say, This is the decree that I give to you. Am I speaking of my own authority? No, I'm speaking on behalf of God's authority. He says, This is the decree which has come upon my Lord, the king. Verse 25, that they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. And they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over thee, till thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomever he will. God is the one who establishes all authorities. Romans 13 tells us that God establishes the princes of the world. Now, many of them do not honor him, but does that mean that God is not sovereign over them? No, God oftentimes gives men wicked rulers whom they desire to rule over them so that they might be, again, judged and brought low. Oftentimes, one of the ways that God uses uh, sort of the, the wicked rulers of our day and age is to actually bring about a uh, sense of a cry for help. If you've studied the book of Judges, for example, you'll see what, what a lot of theologians refer to as the Judges cycle, right? It says they, they, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. There was no king in the day. You see that refrain over and over. There was no king in the land, and everyone did what was, what was right in their own eyes, what was good in their own eyes. And then what happens? It spirals out of control. You have this, this judge's spiral, right? They do wicked things. Bad things happen. They cry out to God. Bad things happen. They cry out to God. God raises up a judge. God delivers them. Everything's happy and good for a generation or two. And then by the end of the book, the period of goodness is decreasing and decreasing, and the amount of wickedness is increasing and increasing over again. Bad things happen. They cry out to God. God gives a judge to rule over them, delivers them. I believe thoroughly that God still works in this way in many ways, that he will allow us to spiral into the depths of depravity that we might cry out to him, right? We might mock an unbeliever, even a pagan Who's, who just gets in a car accident and is stuck in, is maybe they're, maybe they're underwater, all of a sudden, even the most pagan person in the world starts praying, 
Isn't that interesting that it's in our nature? <laughs> Can't help it. They'll start crying out to an unknown God, right? Why is that? Because God knows that in our heart, as Romans 1 tells us, that we all know the truth of God and have simply suppressed it in unrighteousness, esteeming ourselves as God, rather, the creation is God rather than God himself. And so I, I think that's sort of a natural experience that we have, is that we will esteem ourselves. And God uses these moments of being brought low as a means to bring us unto repentance. And ultimately, that's where this passage ends. At the end of uh, this passage, he says, Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee, and break off thy sins by righteousness, and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, if it be a lengthening of thy tranquility. Um, Nebuchadnezzar esteems himself. We'll see in the next portion that he's walking around looking at his lovely you know, gardens of Babylon, thinking how great he is, and that's when God strikes him down. Oftentimes, that, that moment of greatest pride is right when we are humbled. Be careful. I, I've experienced this multiple times when I've, you know, maybe maybe in your youth, men, you've experienced this. You're, you're an 18-year-old guy. You think you're unstoppable, and you, you decide to go do something because you think you're cool, like me trying to run and jump over a fence or something, right? And then you hit it real hard, and you fall on your face. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't mean to look right at you, son. But, uh, right, this is what we do. We have these moments of pride, and we're like, yeah, I could do this. And then you look like a fool and everyone laughs at you and everyone remembers you for that instead of anything else. I experienced this very, very much when I was uh, a young retail store manager, uh, just trying to goof off and make my guys laugh. And I, I had some shoes that were, were very like worn down treads. They were slippery and we had carpet tile on, and I was running and I was sliding on my shoes, just being a dork, you know. And uh, my shoe actually caught some traction and I went face first into the wall, knocked off probably like six or seven shelves, product all over the floor. And of course, my, my staff, who loves and respects me, all immediately went into the back room to watch the footage on slow motion rather than helping me up. It was great. So the point is, pride and arrogance and foolhardiness usually results in a literal fall. So be careful that you don't uh, esteem yourselves greatly. And Nebuchadnezzar experiences this in grand, grand fashion when he is brought low, brought very low. <clears throat> the period of time, just a quick note, most people when they read seven times would, would concur this is seven years. And, and why is it that we know that? There's a lot of internal evidence that tells us this isn't simply seven days or even seven weeks. Because I don't know about you, but no one's fingernails or hair grows that much in that short amount of time. Uh, the, the, he looks like a wild man. And there's some pretty cool artwork out there if you want to go and <laughs> do a little uh, research. There's some pretty interesting uh, painting renderings of, of Nebuchadnezzar's moment. Uh, but he was a haggard man with long hair and long nails by the time this was over. So I think it's acceptable. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about sort of the kingly timelines in the next couple of weeks. As we get into Daniel chapter 5, we're going to be looking at sort of the end of the Babylonian Empire and the movement into the Medo-Persian rule. King Cyrus... I'm going to help us try and reconcile the kingly timeline about, uh, you know, why is it Nabonidus reference, etc. Um, but the seven years fits in well with the trajectory of when ultimately uh, Babylon was, was conquered. So I think that's probably the best way to look at this. But at the end of the day, we believe what Scripture teaches us. We take it at face value. Why? Because God's word is true. So what happened? This man legitimately lost his mind and went and lived in the field. Now, I'm going to again make the argument as we continue on this morning that this was actually an act of mercy. God knew that Nebuchadnezzar's pride would not be broken, that he would not turn to repentance, that he would not know salvation aside from being broken down in this way. But it's also an extension of mercy because, I don't know about you or, or me, but if I were just to go hang out with the cows in the field next to my house for seven years, I don't think I'd survive. I'd probably get my head kicked in for one, and, and two just surviving off of eating who knows what. Right? I believe that God actually miraculously preserved him during this time as he promised in the dream that his kingdom would be preserved and returned to him. This is a God who even in the midst of trial and inflicting of judgment is merciful towards those he judges. So, verse 27 ends with this sort of a call to repentance by Daniel. He says, Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee, and break off thy sins of, uh, by a righteousness, and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. You, the scripture tells us 
Wash you, make you clean, put away the evil uh, of your doings from before mine eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, uh, and plead for the widow. God expects us to pursue faithful repentance and actually to advocate for good. This is a constant uh, refrain in Scripture, that God expects us to actually pursue good of others. And so... Daniel's trying to be gracious towards Nebuchadnezzar here. He's trying to warn him and encourage him that if you just turn away from your foolishness, the Lord might actually be merciful, and this might not need to be. But of course, we know that uh, his disregard for God's word, even the word of his prophet, because of his vainglory, his esteeming of himself, results ultimately in his fall. So verses 28 through 33, we see Nebuchadnezzar's pride and his fall. Most of you probably have Proverbs 16, 18 uh, memorized. Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Let's see if this is true in this account. Verse 28, all this came upon the king Nebuchadnezzar. And at the end of 12 months, in a year, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. And the king spake and said, is not this great Babylon that I, I have built? There's that phrase, I. I have built for the house of my kingdom by the might of my power. I have built my power and for the honor of my majesty. So he's saying, I built it by my strength for me. Now we're all tempted to do this. Instead of saying, God built this, gifted it to me for his glory, and I get to reap the benefits, that's a very different disposition. Be careful that we don't have the same haughty thinking. Because it's, it is good for us, especially gentlemen, when we're trying to build a household and provide for our families, it is good for us to work hard, to earn promotions, to try to extend our, our reach, if you will, professionally or whatever it may be, that we might be able to build something good. In fact, we're commanded in Scripture to provide for our family and to provide an inheritance, right? If we don't, we're actually worse than pagans, Paul tells the Thessalonians. So There's nothing wrong with actually pursuing good works and building up of a kingdom, so to speak. In fact, as I I encouraged this last week, we're all called to build up the kingdom of God. The Great Commission has been extended to us. We have a new dominion mandate, if you will, to carry out the gospel, to build up Christian households in the kingdom of God by His strength, by His power, by His might, for His glory. That is the distinction that we must not uh, forget. Philippians 2 says, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. But in lowliness of mind, let each other esteem one another better than themselves. Look not every man to his own things, but every man to the things of others. In other words, God has called us to live our lives as an outpouring for others. So whenever we build something, we're building it not for our own glory. We're building it, first and all, for God's glory. When I come home, I am trying to provide something for my wife and children, for them, for their good. Now, can I have a sense of relief and pride at a basic level of, of I've worked hard? Yes, maybe, but, but, but be careful even there. Our effort should be focused in such a way that we say, Lord, thank you for giving me these good things. And thank you for sustaining me through the work that I must do to earn these things. Thank you for helping me. Thank you for granting me favor with my employer. Thank you for the provision that you have given me. That should be our disposition. Daniel is trying to get this humility across to Nebuchadnezzar. And unfortunately, Nebuchadnezzar does not heed his word. And what is the result? Well, if you will not humble yourself and give God the glory, God will humble you so that you will learn to do so. I'm going to argue further this morning that that is a gift from God. And what is the result? He's driven out, just as his dream, just as the vision. And if you haven't learned at this point, this deep into the Old Testament, if you haven't learned by this point that when God grants a vision, things come true, he's a true prophet, he's a true God, uh, it happens. (laughs) Just as a dream Uh, portrays. And at the end of that period, at the end of that seven years, likely, it says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, verse 34, lifted up. I'm going to argue that we see now Nebuchadnezzar's, by minimally his restoration, if not his salvation. Verse 34, and at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me, and I blessed 
the Most High. And I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. This is totality. This is exclusive language. So some might argue, well, he may still be syncretistic, and he's merely saying that this God is actually above the other gods. Okay, maybe, granted. But he's saying that this God is the God of all generations, whose kingdom is everlasting. King Nebuchadnezzar has finally realized that just as the vision in Daniel 2 said, his kingdom will fall. There will be the kingdom of the Medo-Persians to follow, and then ultimately Greece, and then Rome, right? And then the coming of the Messiah during the time of the mixed kingdom between Rome and Israel, right? That has occurred according to God's word. Nebuchadnezzar has come to accept that reality. And he has been brought low in such a way, a miraculous way, preserved by God uh, through these seven times, passages of time, and then ultimately restored. He says again in, in verse 35, And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. Nothing. And he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand. Isaiah 46 talks about God declaring the end from the beginning, and who can stop him from accomplishing his will? He is the only God, the one true God says, who can say unto him, what doest thou? So he's recognizing that none of us can tell God, yeah, no, <laughs> not going to be according to your word. None of us can resist his will. And by God's grace, that is a gift to us. So we see restoration and now a new declaration. At the same time, my reason returned unto me and for the glory of my uh, kingdom, mine honor and brightness returned unto me, and my counselors and my lords sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me. He recognizes now that all those things that were his by his supposed might and glory could easily be taken away by the one true God of heaven, and the only one that can return them to him is that same one true God of heaven. Verse 37, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all whose works are truth, and his ways judgment. And those that walk in pride, he is able to abase. He recognizes now that anyone who esteems themselves, God has the power to bring low. And that is the lesson that we must learn this morning. So a few applications for us this morning. One, I'm going to look at the supremacy of God in revealing tr truth. Two, we're going to look at the folly of pride. Three, we're going to look at the mercy of judgment. And four, the glorious hope of the gospel for all. So first things first, we saw at the beginning that the Chaldeans were unable to bring about any interpretation of this dream for Nebuchadnezzar. The supremacy of God in revealing truth is simply this, that God's word will always triumph over any opposition. We see this throughout the old covenant, but in the new covenant as well. We see this through the entire word of God. That any time the world tries to throw a wrench into us, tries to throw uh, some sort of kink into our, our thinking, that God's word is always proven to be true. Now, I, I tend to argue from Scripture alone. That doesn't mean that evidences are not helpful. When we do apologetics and have conversations, we recognize that God's word is proven to be true even as we continue to learn about this world. God's word is revealed to us, and God's word is proven to us. So what we must take away from this this morning, brothers and sisters, is that God will always be made right. He will always be established in truth, no matter what the opposition comes against. And when given uh, a, a dichotomy of decisions, to trust God's word or to trust the world, we must always default to trusting God's word. We may not fully comprehend it, and as we look at, we'll look at next week, sometimes there are, are, are passages that are a little confusing, we're trying to reconcile and figure things out, but we must always come to the scripture with a basis of belief, and God will always be confirmed as true. Always will be. Always will be. We must not look to those advisors in our life as a compelling counterforce to God's word, or to those who seek to teach God's word. This isn't a way of esteeming myself or Pastor Luke and saying, you know, if you have a problem in life, we're the only ones that you can come to by no means. 
But any counsel that you receive from anyone on any subject should always be based in a worldview that comes from God's word. That's true not just in ways of how to raise my family, how to overcome sin and temptation. It's also true in like how to, how to deal with the economy and, and financial investments and having a wise life. It's also true when it comes to working in a way that is pleasing to my employers and pursuing a, a godly vocation. It's also true in how do I vote? How do I think about the general civil, civil sphere that we engage with every day? The Word of God has something to say about every subject under the sun, and He must be the authority to whom we turn at all times. The supremacy of God in His revealing truth. Two, we see the folly of pride. Leviticus 26, 18 through 20 says, And if you will not uh, for all this hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins, and I will break the pride of your power, and I will make your he uh, heaven as iron, and your earth as brass. And your strength shall be spent in vain, for your land shall not yield her increase, neither shall the trees of the land yield their fruits. James 4, 6 says, But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Proverbs 29, 23 says, A man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. And lastly, Matthew 18, 4 says, Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Brothers and sisters, we must recognize that pride is an enemy. Pride is an enemy and a sin that we must overcome. We just came through a whole month dedicated to this great sin. Right? And what is the lesson we learn from it? That when we esteem ourselves and love our sin, we take pride in it. It is the natural progression of our sin. At first, we, we sin and we kind of feel guilty. And then we sin and we, we like it and we don't feel guilty anymore. And then after a while, we actually start try, starting to evangelize our sin. I love my sin so much, I'm proud of it. And I'm going to evangelize it and tell everyone else that they should also love that sin. Right, And, and then, then what, is, what is sort of the trajectory? I'm just using June uh, since I brought it up as an example. What was the trajectory? Well, we're, we're just going to tolerate it. All we are on is tolerance for it. Just, just tolerate this sin. We're not asking you to like it. And now where are we at? If you don't bow the knee and actually esteem it as good and right, not only for me and my private household, but for the entire nation and for the children of our, our country, then you are a hateful bigot. This is what pride does to us. Arrogance does to us. We start esteeming things that God hates, calling them good, and then we become proud of them. Now that's an easy one for us, perhaps, in the church to agree with and say, oh, you're right. How dare they? That's terrible. But evaluate yourself for a second. Take a moment to think about your own sin in your own life. What is the thing that you are prone to pride in? What is the thing that started off as just not a big deal that now you have actually esteemed to such a place that perhaps God is ready to lay the axe to the root. So be humbled, brothers and sisters, before God, because the folly of pride will result in judgment. But here's the hope, brothers and sisters. When that judgment comes, because it will, <laughs> there is mercy. Deuteronomy 8, 1 through 3 says, All the commandments which I commanded thee this day shall ye observe to do, that ye may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swore unto your fathers. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee, to humble thee, to prove thee, and to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldst keep his commandments or no. And he humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger, fed thee with manna, which thou knowest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. God sustained the Israelites in the wilderness through humbling trials, time after time, that they might know to rely upon him alone. Lord, we need water. Strike a rock. Lord, we need food. Here, what is this? Flakes from heaven. <laughs> Lord, that's not good enough. I want meat. Here's some quail coming out your nostrils, you ungrateful ingrates. You know, <laughs> like God humbled them time and time again. Preserve them. And, and how does that story end? Oh yeah, they, they get to the promised land finally, and then they're too scared to go in. I, I, it's just mind-blowing that they would not go and their children ultimately were the ones to possess the land. Their wandering in the wilderness was the result of their own sin. And God humbled them that they might go in. And as you continue the story through Joshua and Judges, we realize that their children still suffered the same sins. They did not trust in God. They trusted in the might of their own strength. They did not fully obey. They only conquered some. They only destroyed some. They withheld back some of God's judgment. 
What happens? Partial obedience is disobedience. And God will discipline. So the mercy of judgment is this, brothers and sisters, that even when we are succumbing to trial, when we feel the, the hand of God pressing us down rather than lifting us up in an embrace, when we feel like God is far from us, God is actually extending mercy. Mercy that we might have our sin killed, that we might have our sin squashed, that we might have our pride and arrogance and vainglory shoved down, that we might look at ourselves and go, man, I can't do this. I need you. So if you are experiencing trial this morning, if you are in a position in life right now where you are enduring perhaps a, a boss that hates you, uh, co-workers that, that are uh, untrustworthy, that blaspheme God all the, all the day, you feel like you're the only worker who's actually having any integrity in your workforce, the Lord will preserve you through this trial. Or perhaps you are experiencing a besetting sin that you just feel like you cannot put to death. Perhaps you are having difficulty mortifying a sin of, of whatever it may be, lust or arrogance or lying, tongues. The Lord will judge you. I struggled with lying a lot when I was younger. And one of the ways that God delivered me from a... Because really, really what I struggled with was not lying. It wasn't that I enjoyed lying. It's that I actually loved my own glory and I wanted people to think I was cool. So it started off with like, I'm just going to twist a true story and make it a little bit more compelling. I'm going to embellish the truth which then became a point where I found myself at 18 in college telling people all sorts of stories about my life that never happened and I couldn't remember what was actually true anymore. And guess, guess how the Lord decided to deliver me from this foolhardy nature of wanting to be liked by so many people that probably would have liked me if I would just been honest, right? I mean, even if they hadn't, that would have still been better. Well, the way that the Lord delivered me from that was by bringing me into an engagement with a woman whom I'm married to now. Some, it'll be 20 years this week. And I had to spend, I don't know, several months confessing, <laughs> trying to figure out what the truth was, all the things that I probably lied to her about that I didn't even realize I lied to her about. That was the most humbling experience of my life. Being brought so low, recognizing that I was a sinner that no one should really love. We all have that moment in our life. We all have those times. And when God brings us into judgment, when you sin against someone and you get caught, that is God's mercy in judgment. When you are looking at something you shouldn't be looking at and you get caught, when you say something that is a lie and someone catches you in that detail, God's judgment in that moment, that humiliation, that guilt, that shame is God's gift to you to bring mercy to you. Because if you are faithful to profess and confess your sins to a holy God, He is faithful and just to not only forgive you that sin, but this is the important part, to cleanse you of all unrighteousness, to restore you to goodness before Him. We confess our sin every week for just this reason. Not because we, we believe that we have to do some sort of work to maintain our salvation, but because it is good and edifying for our spirit to remember that we are sinners. No matter how holy and pious our lives may appear to others, we know our hearts. So brothers and sisters, when God judges you, it is mercy to you that you might repent and be restored. So fathers and mothers, an application for you in particular, when you discipline your child, always give them the gospel at the end. Bring them low. Help them to confess their sin. Help them to hate their sin. Help them to sorrow over their sin and to weep. But give them the gospel and restore them to fellowship. The gospel restores. God does not simply forgive us. He also restores us. And so this is the hope and gospel for all, brothers and sisters. We are all wretches. Scripture says, And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And Paul says, of whom I am the chief. And we all could probably say that with him. How be it for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering, for a pattern of them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. So the question is, what will God use to draw you into repentance? What will God use to draw you into repentance? Here is my <laughs> exhortation, my admonition to you this morning. If you remember one thing from the past 40 odd minutes this morning, remember this. Do not waste your trials. Do not waste your trials. Start worshiping God now in the midst of them. 
Thank God for the difficulties in your life. Thank God for the times where you feel like you are far from God, that you're under his hand of judgment. Thank God for them. Change your disposition. Have that paradigm shift in the way you think about your life. That when something goes bad, your first thought is not why God, but God, what would you teach me? What would you have me do? What would you have me know? Don't waste your trials, brothers and sisters. Do not waste your trials. The gospel of God is this, that God, while we are yet sinners, sent his son to live the life we could not live, to die the death that we deserve, so that in his resurrection we might be united to him in resurrected life. That is the glory of the gospel to all who believe. And how did he do that? By inflicting the most painful trial ever upon his son, who was the most un... <laughs> if anyone did not deserve death, Christ and Christ alone is the only one. And yet God used that. The greatest crime against God, the infliction of the pain of death upon his son. He used that great trial, that great suffering that Christ endured on our behalf as the very means by bringing about salvation. By his death, death has been conquered. By his life, true life has been promised and achieved. So brothers and sisters this morning, do not waste your trials, but rather worship God in the midst of them. And that is exactly what I hope you will do this week. As we depart from here this morning, I pray that you will spend this week, every moment when you wake up, to give God thanks for the breath that is in your lungs. When you're driving to work or, or about your, your daily tasks, that when those trials arise, that your first thought would be to check yourself, to check your pride, to check your arrogance, to check the self-love. Lord, how could you do this to me? Look at me, how great I am. Because that's really what we're saying. How dare you, God? I'm unfaithful. Why would, you, why would you have me lose my job? Why would you have me get this diagnosis? Why would you take my child from me? Even in those moments, even in those moments, brothers and sisters, give God thanks. It's okay to mourn. It's okay to lament. We have a whole section in the Psalms just for those moments, and we sing them. But then turn to God. Give Him the glory. Do not wallow in shame and unrepentant sin, but seek forgiveness and restoration with whoever you've sinned against. And give God the glory. I praise God that we have this testimony for all time in Daniel chapter 4 from Nebuchadnezzar, a Babylonian king. Babylon. Read Revelation. Babylon is bad. Okay? It is for all time the epitome of evil in our symbolic language. And yet, if a Babylonian king can give Most High God praise after a humbling trial and event, how much more should we, the king's people, bought with a price, adopted as sons and daughters, how much more then should we give God praise? So let us do that this morning, and let us do that throughout the week. And as we gather again next Lord's Day, I pray that we'll be restored in joy, that we'll have hope, that we'll have peace, and that whatever befalls us this week, that we would give God the glory in all things, humbling us, yes, but lifting us up and setting us with Christ in the heavenly places. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have done just that, that you've taken us who were low and without esteem, and you've made us holy, not by any uh, merit that was within us or by any work that we've done by our own hands, but Lord, you, by your uh, everlasting grace and mighty work of mercy, through the judgment placed upon Christ, your Son, have established us as your sons and daughters. Lord, I pray that we'd be humbled before you, giving you glory in all things. And that as we worship you this morning and partake in the supper as the Son has encouraged us, Lord, that we would be full of joy this morning and that we would leave this place abounding in thanksgiving. For we have much to be thankful for in the midst of trial. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.